Thank you for joining us this morning at Triune Mercy Center. And I would like to thank all of you uh, Triune worshipers who are continuing to send in your offering because um, I'm telling you we need it at this time, as well as all of you who are sending in uh, extra checks for motel relief. So thank you very much. Our artwork this morning is by Charles Anderson, and it's one of my favorites. Actually, this one hangs in my office. And it is a, sh uh, a picture from inside the tomb showing the three crosses um, that, of course, was uh, Jesus in the center and the two criminals on his side. And thank you to Justin and Andy for our music this morning. May we pray together. Oh, Lord, let us understand what the passion of the Christ really means. Let us take from this final Sunday of Lent what you would have us take what you would have us feel, what you would have us believe. We pray in the name of the one who lived it. Amen. If you have worshipped with us before or heard me address a civic club or a book club, you have probably heard me say one thing over and over. It's the same thing I tell everyone who tours our building, everyone who comes for a backyard mission day, Everyone who asks about Playback Cafe, and this is it. A homeless man once said to me, Pastor, do you know the worst thing about being homeless? It's not being cold or wet or hungry. The worst thing is being looked right through. I think that's not unlike what Jesus would tell us. You know the worst thing about my death? It wasn't the beatings or the crucifixion, or the thirst. The worst thing about my death was the betrayal. Why do I think that? Because of the way Matthew tells his story of Jesus' last hours. He infuses it with betrayal. We've mentioned in here before that when something is mentioned three or six times in a scripture passage, we're supposed to sit up and take notice. Well, in Matthew's extended passion narrative, which is way too long for us to read this morning, he uses the word betray or betrayer 11 times. He uses desert or deserter four times. He uses deny five times. So in all, that is 20 times that Matthew uses some form of these words to indicate the abandonment of Jesus as he went through his last supper, his arrest, his trials, and his crucifixion 20 times. And that doesn't even count his lonely cry from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think we're supposed to sit up and take notice. It's always a challenge to choose scripture for today because it is both Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday. We could spend our time on the ride into Jerusalem, ride on King Jesus, or we could spend our time at the cross. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I almost always choose the cross, the passion story. For to not do so is to skip fully a quarter of our gospel writings, to skip blithely into Easter without an understanding of the pain and the sacrifice. So I don't want to read this entire passage on video, but even in this abbreviated reading, look for all the verbs and nouns that indicate abandonment. So I'm reading from Matthew 26, starting with verse 14, if you'd like to read along. Then one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Now, then there's a section about setting up the Passover meal, skipping down to verse 20. When it was evening, Jesus took his place with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes and is, is written of him. 
But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. Then skip down to verse 30. They went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the other disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And then we have the story of Peter and James and John falling asleep. Skip down to verse 45. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And then we read about the arrest and the cutting of a guard's ear. And then this final convicting line. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. That last line kind of sums it up, doesn't it? All the disciples deserted him and fled. And it gets worse. We didn't even get to the part about Peter denying Jesus three times by the fire in the courtyard. We didn't even get to the part where Jesus hung on the cross and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mel Gibson's famous movie, The Passion of the Christ, did a good job showing the physical pain of Jesus' last 12 hours. It's harder to show the emotional pain of the betrayals, the denials, the desertions, the forsakenness. For if the story of Jesus is the greatest story ever told, this part is the saddest story ever told. For three years, these 12 disciples had been Jesus' constant companions. Just think about all they had been through together. Banquets at the fine homes of tax collectors. Nights sleeping under the stars. Riding out storms on the Sea of Galilee. Attending weddings with wine. Witnessing exorcisms. Seeing blind men healed. Watching Lazarus emerge from the tomb. Hearing Jesus teach in synagogues and watching, probably terrified, when he turned over the money changer's table in the temple. And now, they were scared that what was awaiting Jesus would spill over onto them as well. And so the people he loved and cherished and treasured most betrayed him, deserted him, denied him. You know, we too are living in a time of great fear. And fear can cause bad behavior, as we saw with the disciples. Fox News disseminates sarcasm and ridicule instead of correct information and then lies about it. People clear out stores of what they need without worrying about what their neighbors may need. Science deniers of all ill convene crowds for worship services or pronounce that the coronavirus is God's judgment on humans. We can betray 
our true Christian faith as surely as Judas did. In our vocabulary, a Judas is a friend who turns on us, a friend who betrays our trust. A Judas goat is the animal that leads sheep or cattle to the slaughterhouse that lures them to their death. This first Judas, Judas Iscariot, took 30 pieces of silver from the chief priest to point them to a time and a place where they might arrest Jesus without inciting all the crowds who were filling Jerusalem at that time. Well, Judas and the priest didn't come up with that figure out of thin air. 30 pieces of silver was the payment commanded in the book of Exodus when a man's servant was gored by another man's ox. In other words, it represented the price of a servant's life. It was payment for a suffering servant. After taking the money, Judas reclined at the Passover meal with Jesus, and only the two of them understood those words that passed between them. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me, Jesus said. And Judas answered, Surely not I, Rabbi. I am always struck by the treachery that runs through this Last Supper. Just before they ate, Jesus warned of one who would betray him. Just after they ate, Jesus told the disciples that they would all desert him before the night was over. Peter simply couldn't believe that. Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples chimed in in agreement. And then they went to Gethsemane, where Peter, James, and John practiced that small betrayal of falling asleep. Judas kissed him, Jesus was arrested, and the inevitable drama was set in motion. And then there is that simple, almost throwaway line at the end of the arrest. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. All the disciples deserted him and fled. How lonely Jesus must have felt. How lonely we feel when we are betrayed. For we cannot be betrayed by strangers. We can betray, be betrayed only by friends only by loved ones. Years ago, we realized that a lot of people that we see at Triune have been betrayed in the most unspeakable ways. Not just neglect, but out and out abuse. And those betrayals very often lie at the root of mental illness and mental anguish and post-traumatic stress disorder and self-medication and addiction. With counseling and welcome and community, with trauma-informed care, we have tried to bust those barriers of distrust and self-destruction that have been erected as a result. Betrayal is part of the human condition, and that is why Jesus faced betrayal at the end of his life. That is why he faced the worst thing we know. I think he wanted to face what we face, experience what we experience, be betrayed because we are betrayed. That is why we have a Savior who understands betrayal. He knows the hurt and the anguish and the misery of being let down, and he can enter into that hurt with us. The season of Lent is important because it cautions us not to rush to an easy Easter. We cannot reach Easter without the trials and the crucifixion, without the humiliation and the betrayal. In the same way, we cannot rush to health and joy without acknowledging the betrayals that have taken place in our lives without acknowledging the way we have betrayed. In this Holy Week, 
May we seek healing for ourselves and our neighbor. May we seek solidarity with our Lord.